Hello my friends and foes, my name is Lily and today I'm going to be talking about KPV and I'm going to be giving you the truth. I have sifted through the evidence and I think that there's a lot of misunderstandings about the utility that KPV actually has. So join me as I immerse you in the truth of KPC. This KPV, this is my comprehensive autistic frenzy of a peptide fragment that might be useful for you. We want to look at things with utility because that's what we're here for, right? <laughs> Firstly, what is KPV? So it is a very small three amino acid peptide, and this is the minimum effective sequence for it to have the desired physiological effects. It is a fragment of AMSH, which we will talk more about later. Its proposed uses are gut disorders, skin disorders, and wound healing, and it's sometimes stacked with BBC-157 and TB-500 for that extra adjunct to potentially help with injury healing. Its typical delivery is oral, less commonly topical. It is rare rarely ejected, and studies have demonstrated consistent safety, but there's a lot more to it. So I'm going to grab you and I'm going to force you down this rabbit hole. So join me on to its mechanism of action. This is going to be a little bit convoluted, but it acts on the melanocortin pathway. If that seems familiar for you, that is because that is also what a melanotan 1 and 2 are derived from. Of course, they are longer amino acid sequences and act on more receptors. KPV is simply an attempt to have more of a specific outcome. So because of this, KPV was was studied. It's been known for a long time that the melanocortin pathway had anti-inflammatory effects. And we see this with melanotan 1 and 2, but the problem is it wasn't able to be used in the clinical environment because the side effect of that is being horny and getting tan, which sounds great to some people, but unfortunately it doesn't make a good drug. <laughs> KPV's mechanism of action seems to be twofold. Now, first and foremost, the most important way that it can be uptaken is by the PEPT1 transporter. Why is this even remotely relevant? Well, peptides don't usually have any capacity to inert effect orally. That's why even BPC-157, I firmly believe only has a local effect. To illustrate my point, the FDA only has eight approved oral peptide therapies. This is because it's just so tricky. KPV is unique in that it can be uptaken by these transporters. I've already illustrated that, but where does it go from there? So it's transported into enterocytes, then it's hydrolyzed. So it's broken down into its constituent parts, lysine, proline, valine. And that's what's released into the bloodstream. The real utility is that it has been shown to selectively suppress NF-kappa B signaling, reducing pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleucin-6 and TNF-alpha. Another potential for its mechanism of action is acting on receptors. So this would be the MC1R receptor, which is mostly present on immune cells, giving it an immunomodulary effect potentially. But the main shortfall here, in order for it to act on this immune receptor, it would have to ha be systemically present. It also seems to promote tight junction integrity, which is very important for, of course, gut inflammatory disorders. Allow me to pick your brain real quick. Why do you think that Cigarette smokers have lower rates of ulcerative colitis. Nicotine also seems to suppress NF-kappa B signaling, which is fascinating. So it has an immunomodulatory response in addition to, of course, it's vasoconstrictive. So it's going to decrease that interstitial infiltration of immuno fucking whatever the hell things. I like my zens, okay? I like my zens. <coughs> Moving on to something a little unique that I still wanted to touch on in regards to KVP, and this is the current patents. Understanding the current patents that utilize some sort of KVP therapy is immensely, immensely useful when evaluating what we can use it for ourselves. So treatment of inflammatory bowel disease, we have the KPV ointments or creams. Then L'Oreal actually has a patent for cosmetics for use in skin healing and renewal. So this is something used in cosmetics. Then we have eye drops for inflammation for eye infections, and then there's a first patent for fever reduction and inflammation, and then there's a bunch of similar but modified versions of KPV. <laughs> Because it's a tripeptide, it's extremely hard to patent. So most of the pharmaceutical companies do have to experiment with analogs or, like this study shows, via hyaluronic acid functionalized nanoparticles. If you take a look at the second study, it illustrates the point that scientists are actively working on trying to modify it to make it more pharmacologically viable. 
and to be able to patent it. Of course, because you have to patent the delivery system, you can't patent the tripeptide. <laughs> Okay, now you're like, okay, Lily, that's all fun and good, but I want to use this for my own purposes. How do I use this for my own purposes? What is the dosage? How do I use this? Okay, as it stands in the current gray area composition, KPV seems to have utility in gut inflammation solely, unless you can find a topical formulation to treat your skin conditions. Topical, not oral. Dosage is very elusive. There are no studies for sub-Q. There are no human studies for oral. But off of purely mechanism, it seems to be a very poor candidate for sub-Q injection. In the animal studies that I took a look at, they're using very high doses and they're oftentimes injecting it or running it through IV. So we really can't carry over that to humans. We can carry over the mechanism. Look, okay, well, how would this mechanism apply? But the reason why I do drive so hard into delivery is the fact that this is how we're getting it into our body. If it's not delivered to the active site that you want it to act on, what is it doing for you? It's doing nothing. We can talk theory all day, but we have to make sure the formulation is correct. So this is something I feel super strongly about because like I said, there's very few peptides that are ever bioavailable orally, but yet we propagate this idea that it can be. And it's just not streamlined as people think it out to be. And like I said, off a purely mechanism, it's a poor candidate for sub-Q and it's a poor candidate for any oral systemic effects. I've also seen it as oral sprays. Potentially, I will say that this could be for targeted oral inflammation, such as an ulcer. Most importantly, KPV is cationic, so it won't even diffuse through oral mucosa. And I'm not really sure how those formulations are intended to be taken, if they're intended for systemic or they're intended for targeted oral. But here is a um, example of something I saw, and it says allows for rapid absorption, which is just a demonstration that a lot of this stuff is just complete bullshit and people are just gonna sell you stuff. There is no evidence that it allows for rapid absorption like at all it's actually the exact opposite i don't understand this it's absolutely absurd and it's just a money grab <laughs> oral dosage companies seem to be selling them at the 500 microgram range all of them that i've seen have been in microgram this perplexes me as we have zero human studies and in my opinion that seems to be far too low i would say people with very active, severe gut inflammation will probably have an easier time absorbing this and can maybe use lower concentrations just because there's more transporters. All we really have to go off of is allometric scaling and this is low value data because it's trying to extrapolate what these rodent dosages would look like in humans. And these rodent dosages were done with IV. They don't scale properly, especially with something that has a local effect because local concentration is different than plasma levels 100 percent pharmacology is complex so i will say that the rodent studies certainly put the dose way higher like 20 milligrams to 40 milligrams if you are allometrically scaling but i just i don't even this is all we have to go off of but to be honest that's absolutely shit that's absolutely shit but i would say like based off of things I think that we should be pushing the dosages a little higher. I, w I would say that's reasonable. For for orally delivered peptides, I think the dosages have got to be a little higher than 500 micrograms. The only KVP formulation that we have that has had human dosage studies is actually intravaginally. So... And I believe intravaginally it was used in like dosages of like a thousand micrograms. Friends and foes, thank you for staying tuned for this video. I know that it could probably use some more organizational efforts. Unfortunately, um, okay, sorry. I just wanted to zen real quick. And unfortunately, I'm quite a scatterbrained individual. Um, and that's what you're going to get. You're going to get rambles because I like to go into the weeds of things, which is problematic because I don't think a lot of people like to hear the weeds. They like to hear, does it work or not? Okay. So what's the gist? It's not going to work systemically through oral delivery. It is not going to work for sports injury healing. It will work for severe gut inflammation, probably at higher doses than is clinically standard. It will not work for sub-Q. It will not work for oral sprays. It seems to have more research that it will work for skin conditions. That's it.
because these tripeptides are chewed up quickly in extracellular fluid in plasma and also are expected to have a very short systemic exposure. They have super fast clearance because they're very small and there's no studies. Of course, you could overcome this degradation with a chemical tweak, but that's not how it's being sold. 